Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about a really interesting concept. So let's get right into it. All right, so the problem for today is d1 half dx1 half of x. Now, if you're a calculus student, you're probably going to be wondering what in the world does this even mean? So let's take a closer look. Commonly in traditional calculus, we're taught that the normal derivative d dx of some function f of x tells us the rate of change of f of x at a given x. So, for example, I'm sure all of you know, d dx of x squared would just be 2x. So that means at the point x equals 2, for example, the slope of the tangent line would be 2 times 2, which is 4, just like that. Now, later on, if you get further, like past calc AB maybe, or even calc BC, you learn about concavity, which is the second derivative just like this, d squared dx squared. And this is simply our notation for, in, for notating this. And this tells us um, the way a curve is shaped. Is it going, is it, is the derivative increasing or is it decreasing? So if I have a function like this, on this plane like right here, the concavity at this point and this interval to right about here, it's going upward. The derivative is originally negative. It becomes zero and becomes positive here. But then at this point right here, we call this the point of inflection, POI. This is where the derivative starts decreasing because you can see right here, it becomes negative and it goes zero. So it's decreasing from, where, from this point onwards. So that's how we define our second derivative. Now, now we have a better understanding of what these numbers mean in the derivative, we can take an approach to solving this. d1 half dx1 half. So the d1 half in this case isn't really well defined, but you can imagine it as something in between to the, describing the slope of the tangent line of a graph and the concavity. Now, a man named Riemann has done a lot of stuff in calculus, but he also created a definition for cases like these. And it's called the Riemann-Liouville definition. Um, I apologize if I mispronounced that, but here's how it goes. So he stated that d one half of dx one half, or not of, but d d one half dx one half of f of x can be defined using this operator. This colon equal means defined, so it's defined as this: the, der the derivative of one over square root pi in parentheses integral from zero to x of f of t over x minus t to the one half power dt, just like this. It is an absolute beast. And he just stated this definition out of the blue. We're gonna be analyzing how he got this and how we can break this down a little bit. So for the purposes of this video, we're gonna be solving this derivative given this formula that Riemann defined as such and see what this gives us. And then we're gonna generalize it to other fractional powers that might not be one half. So. If we look at our integral, we can define this integral part right here to be i of x, just normal calculus. We can say i of x is equal to integral 0 to x of, and this is f of t. f of t in this case is just going to be x right here. So we're going to replace it with t all over x minus t to the 1 half power dt. We can simply do some u substitution here. We have u is equal to x minus t. That means t is equal to x minus u and dt equals negative du. Now we have to also change our bounds as well. So when t is this, when t is zero right here, what is u? This is our definition for u. So we plug that in, u is equal to x then. And then when t is equal to x right here, which is this bound, um, u is equal to x minus x, which just becomes zero. So we can write our i of x to be such. This is equal to the integral from x to zero because our bound swapped of x minus u all over u to the one half power. And then remember, dt is negative du, so we do negative du here. But I don't like x being in the lower bound because usually that's not very typical. So I'm gonna swap this. The integral from a to b is equal to the negative integral from b to a. So I can pull out a negative here, swap these, but notice that our du has a negative in front of it. So the negative from swapping the bounds and this negative cancel. So this gives us i of x is equal to simply the integral from 0 to x of x minus u all over u to the 1 half du, simply like that, Oops. du. Now, we can simply solve this. We can separate this up. This is the integral from 0 to x of x over u to the 1 half power minus u to the u over u <laughs> minus u over u to the 1 half all du. Continuing on, we can say this is x. We can just plot the x because this is not really the, the variable we're integrating with respect to. 
um, because it's u in this case. The just because it's in the balance doesn't mean we can't pull it out. So we have z the x times the zero, uh, the integral from zero to x of u to the negative one half because it's in the denominator du. And I'm gonna separate these two integrals and then minus the integral from zero to x of u to the one half du. So now we can compute this. We have simply um, x times what is the integral of uh, u to the negative one half? We add one and divide by the new exponent. So then we get, um, I have to use brackets here, 2u to the 1 half bounded by 0 to x minus, and let's integrate this, you have u to the 3 over 2 divided by 3 over 2, which becomes times 2 over 3, bounded by 0 to x, and let's keep plugging in. We have x times, um, the, let's just plug in the bounds accordingly. You have 2 root x minus 2 root 0, which just becomes 0, minus, let's plug it in here, 2 over 3, I'll use brackets, 2 over 3, uh, x to the 3 over 2, uh, minus 2 over 3 to the 0, or just, yeah, 3 over 2, so that becomes 0 as well. Simplify this a little bit further. What we're going to get finally is we're going to get x times 2, oops, 2 root x minus 2 over 3, x to the 3 over 2, which is equal to 2x to the 3 over 2. I'm going to rewrite it a little bit, 2 over 3x to the 3 over 2 because we can simply add our exponents here. We had one and one half right here, so that becomes three over two. And lastly, we can simply subtract because these are the same exponent now. We have four over three x to the three over two, and voila. Now, if you look at our original pro oops, that's pretty right shifted. But if you look at our original problem statement, where we began our integral, which I just said, let's go with the flow here. We said we're gonna be taking, um, yeah, yeah this, this one over root pi doesn't matter. We can pull that out because it's in the derivative. But we defined this to be our i of x, and we're taking the derivative of our i of x. So now that we computed our i of x, let's take the derivative. That means we had our, um, our original problem statement. We had this. I'll copy it down, just like this. One half of f of x is defined as such. One over root pi d over dx i of x. And now that we have our i of x, which is this, we can plug that in. So now, we could say that this is equal to 1 over square root of pi. What's the derivative of this? I'm sure all of you know how to do this. You could pull down the exponent. You have 4 over 3 times 3 over 2 times x to the 1 half, just like that. 3 and 3 cancel. This cancels into 2. You have 1 over root pi of 2x to the 1 half. Simplifying things, oops, I wrote root 2. That should be a pi. And you get, ladies and gentlemen, you get 2 square root of x over square root of pi. That is our answer to the half derivative of x, where f of x right now is equal to x. So if you look at our original problem statement, which we started with, and the definition I said we should just assume for now, or the Riemann-Liouville fractional derivative form like this, it turns out that Riemann generalized this to all types of derivatives, even ones that are not one half either. So even two thirds or pi over two or any number that you want. So. Uh, this power actually is referring to the order of the derivative, not really a power. So the generalized formula that Riemann created is as follows. d alpha dx alpha of f of x is defined to be, which is what that colon means in the equal sign again, of 1 over the gamma function of the ceiling of alpha minus alpha, <laughs> a lot of alphas, times the ceiling of alpha th derivative really funny wording here, See dx alpha, like this, times the integral from 0 to x of f of t all over x minus t, all over x minus t, to the alpha minus ceiling of alpha plus 1 dt. That is a beast of a formula. That is absolutely insane. And proving this is is absolutely is really diabolical, to be honest. Um, but I could do it in another video. I don't have the the proof memorized on the top of my head, so I will have to research that. Um, but yeah, this is the generalized formula, and you can plug in any alpha you want. Um, the restrictions, uh, th there are restrictions, I believe, in the complex world, but that's a discussion for a whole another video. Um, and I'm not even sure what it means to have alpha is less than less than zero. Um, what does it mean to have a negative one-th derivative? 
Are you taking the integral? So it, it doesn't, this is very hazy in definitions and the meaning of it. But remember, when something isn't well-defined, sometimes people well-define it just like this. So while it might not have the traditional the traditional workings of a, of a derivative like this, if it's the, the order is one of x squared, it may not function the same way, but it does have a definition like this that we can use to describe the, the partiality or, um, it's a weird word, but the halfness that this type of derivative describes. So, for example, if I plugged in d two-thirds of dx two-thirds, sure, I can use the formula to solve for whatever that is of f of x, but what does it mean, or how much does it describe? Does that two-thirds a, a meter of dis confidence, or or describing how much slope it has? It's very weird and hazy, but that's up to you. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know if I made any mistakes, um, and drop a comment and drop a follow. Thank you, guys. See ya.